in this important hearing on the Western Hemisphere and its budget priorities, and uh, for putting an august panel together. Uh, so um, we welcome you all. Uh, fentanyl is the leading cause of drug overdose deaths in the United States, including in my home state of New Jersey, with a staggering 193 persons a day, a day dying from fentanyl poisoning. We know that the vast majority of fentanyl trafficked into the United States is produced in clandestine labs in Mexico with precursor chemicals sourced from the PRC, something the Mexican president says doesn't even exist. So it's a little hard to deal with a partner when they start off from taking the proposition at the highest levels of government doesn't even exist. While Mexico's commitment has been generously to say slow to come around, we must recognize that realistic solutions to this crisis I hope, uh, as some are suggesting, are U.S. military troops or bombs in Mexico. Uh, that's pretty outrageous. Sovereign country. As much as I don't like their lack of cooperation, that's pretty outrageous. But instead, it seems to me we require greatly improved law enforcement cooperation and greater port and border security measures. Assistant Secretary Robinson, INL's budget request for Mexico does not speak, in my view, to the urgency of the challenge at hand but it does indicate the challenges we've had in bilateral cooperation. It also doesn't capture the whole host of initiatives that the administration is carrying out to combat the crisis. Can you please lay out the work the administration is doing, and have you seen sufficient political will from the government of Mexico to effectively tackle the fentanyl crisis? I heard your answer to Senator Murphy. It was very diplomatic, but that's not what I'm looking for. Thank you, Senator uh, and Chairman, uh, for that for that question. Uh, first, let me just say uh, the challenge. To be honest, the challenge that we have with Mexico is the their their unwillingness to put their resources uh, in the into the sufficient resources into the fight, and we are pushing them uh, to do that. Uh, the partners that we are working with want to do more. They want to do better. They want to be. Um, uh, they want to partner with us on greater security, both in Mexico and at the border, their northern border and our southern border. Uh, the resources uh, on the Mexican side, uh, up to this point, have not been uh, sufficient to the task, and we continue to engage with them uh, on that. Well, you tell me where your resources are. I'll tell you where your priorities are. And if the resources aren't there, that's not a priority for the Mexican government. Well, we will. So you, you can't have a partner uh, uh, unless you have both sides of the equation working towards the same goal. Well, what I, what I will say is we will continue to to uh, engage with our Mexican counterparts, both diplomatically and at the operational level, to to see if we can't uh, uh, convince them that they need to put more resources at in that. At some point, we, if we keep doing the same thing, it doesn't work. You have to think uh, about what other consequences there should be. This year alone, there have been over 2,400 murders and 950 kidnappings in Haiti. This has been the direct result of a worsening epidemic of gang violence and widespread criminal, coll criminal collusion between Haitian elites and gangs, an issue that I'm working to address through my Haitian Criminal Collusion Transparency Act. Given the appalling security situation in Haiti, I agree with the UN Secretary General's assessment that, quote, a robust use of force, close quote, by a multinational police force is necessary to help restore law and order. We have seen that the Kenyan government has offered to lead such a force and conducted an assessment trip to Haiti last month. So Sister Secretary Robinson, now that Kenyan assessment trip has concluded, what can you share about the specific resources the U.S. government plans to contribute to the multinational force, including any police or military assets, logistics support, and other financial resources? And what progress, concrete progress, has been made in securing commitments from other nations to the multinational force? Thank you again, uh, Senator Menendez, uh, for, Chairman Menendez, for that for that question. Uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, go to Nairobi and uh, speak with the Kenyans directly. Uh, we are grateful that they have that they are considering uh, this proposal to lead uh, the the uh, this multinational uh, uh, support operation. Um, we have committed to them that we are going to work. 
uh, with our international partners to make sure that they have the tools and the funding necessary. Uh, we have identified uh, a substantial amount, both uh, uh, the State Department and the Department of Defense have identified a substantial amount to kick off uh, the beginning of that funding, but we understand that we are not going to be able to do this alone. We are reaching out to uh, partners in the region. We're reaching par to reaching out to partners outside of the region, both uh, for materiel, for personnel, and for financial resources. Well, could you could you could we engage with you on this uh, uh, to find out exactly where we're at on those uh, efforts? Absolutely. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, if I may, one last question. Uh, uh, Administrator Escobar, good to see you. Uh, I put out a, a paper on migration called the Menendez Plan. It recognizes that there are 20 million people in the Western Hemisphere, 20 million, who are displaced, refugees, or seeking asylum in other countries. Unless we deal with that reality, then the challenges that we have at the southern border will be uh, minor today compared to 20 million people who, if they cannot be assimilated in these countries, will come marching north. And that will be a major crisis. So I see that uh, as part of this effort, I have legislation forthcoming on Venezuela that has 300 million in assistance uh, to Latin American communities hosting large numbers of refugees and migrants. I understand the President's supplemental budget request includes 200 million to expand integration efforts. Can you speak, help us understand in practical terms how important it is to have this additional funding for integrating refugees and migrants within the hemisphere itself? Thank you, Chairman, for that question. And, and you're absolutely right. Uh, and the reason we, we put those funds in the supplemental is because the, the timing couldn't be more consequential. Of those 20 million people uh, it, that are internally displaced, you know, 7 million have come solely from Venezuela, and it's now 7.5. Um, and that's new. These are historic levels for the region. And the main countries, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and Brazil, have taken on over 85% of that displacement. So it's through their policies that uh, uh, their generous and pragmatic pro, uh, policies of, of integration that uh, these migrants are being absorbed in these communities, they're being provided jobs, healthcare, schools, uh, but it's a very tenuous uh, moment because these policies have a high upfront cost even if eventually migrants end up contributing robustly to those economies, the upfront cost is high, so it's straining local budgets, and the political cost is high. So our ability to, um, to support our partners in integration, in policies that help them validate degrees, in providing schools and healthcare, and the regularization process, really, as you said, will make a difference on whether um, those people can restart their lives in these countries, or they will um, continue onward migration to our border. Well, we will either help them there, or they will be knocking on the door here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Anders. Senator Haggerty. Uh, 